Hello everyone and welcome to another race guide for Blood Bowl 3. Today we've got Orcs. My name is Andy Davo and there's been a few comments uh, over the last few videos in terms of who I am uh, and why, why am I making these videos. So since we're reaching a large new audience, I thought I'd explain it myself a little bit. I've been playing Blood Bowl for the last 15 years or so. I've been playing it at a competitive level, a very high competitive level, pretty much all that time. Uh, over the last six years, I've been playing on Blood Bowl 2. Uh, my credentials there have been uh, it consistently inside the top 10 um, win rates for all of people in the public matchmaking ladder. I've won the public matchmaking ladder. A separate ranking system was brought in called ELO, ELO uh, and I was uh, for a period of time top uh, of the ELO ranking system. I've held uh, multiple uh, top win rates for specific races in Blood Bowl 2 and then over at the tabletop which is the other side of Blood Bowl that I play uh, I have had a race all the way up as high as second in the world. I've played maybe over in that time uh, about 6,000 games of Blood Bowl overall. And so I've got a, a vast wealth of experience to pull on uh, as we move into this new rule set, which is the Blood Bowl 3 or Blood Bowl 2020 rule set. Now, enough about me. Let's actually talk about Orcs. Today's race, Orcs have five different positionals and their main strengths really are that they are incredibly well armoured uh, with being arm armour 9 across all the core positionals. Uh, one player at armour 8, um, and one player at armor seven. That's in old money. Uh, in new money, you'll talk about this in uh, AV10+, plus, AV9+, plus, and AV8+. Plus. They are also high strength uh, with a troll, which is strength five, uh, and a collection of strength four players to support the troll. This means that their main strategy uh, is to get into a fist fight with your opponent, and then once they have either pinned down, knocked over, uh, or removed uh, some of the opponent team, then they will walk past with the ball, and they'll go and score a touchdown. So they're not going to score a lot of touchdowns, uh, but they are going to have a big fight. So if that seems interesting to you, let's dive into the rest of the video, uh, where the next section I'm going to introduce the players specifically, and then how to level them up. Right, we've introduced the team overall. Now let's have a specific look at the players. Um, as I said, there are six different players on the Orc team, uh, and you'll notice, first of all, that some of them are quite expensive. Uh, we've got a trial at 115k and some 80 and 90k players. This does mean that when we get to the team building section, uh, that's going to play a part and we're not necessarily going to get everything we want straight away. Now, the troll is an untrained troll. Uh, in Blood Bowl 3, there are trained trolls and untrained trolls. And really what that actually means, if you're curious, uh, is that the loaner value here changes from plus 4 down to plus 3. Um, I'm not aware of any plus 2 trolls, but th there are definitely plus 3 and plus 2 trolls out there. If you're not sure what loaner does, just a quick recap. That means that if you want to re-roll a, a block action or a go for it, uh, with the troll before you can do that and use a team reroll you have to pass a loner roll so in this case uh, it's a 50 50 chance of whether you're going to be allowed to reroll it uh, consider it this way that the troll is now a very risky proposition and could end your turn immediately and there's only a 50 50 chance you can fix it or try and fix it there is one other new skill in here which is projectile vomit uh, this is new from blood bowl 2 this places a block uh, standing adjacent to a tanning player roll a d6 on a roll of one you don't do anything against the opponent player you actually uh, cover yourself in vomit uh, and on a two plus you can then actually vomit on them uh, it works then at the same way a stab action from the previous game, which is you roll against the opponent's armor, then you roll against the opponent's injury. If you break the armor, then you're allowed to go in, in, into injure injury. It also says you can only use it once per term and you can't use it with frenzy or multiple block. Uh, the idea was that it was supposed to try and replace uh, a block action with the troll and make it slightly less risky. And, and overall, mathematically, uh, it is actually a better action than blocking from a reliability point of view. You're going to turn over a lot less. That's again uh, for a rookie troll anyway. Now, the trolls are great for certain things. They're not very fast. They're only movement four. They have got strength five. So they're very, you know, very, very strong. Uh, not many players can go into a direct confrontation with them. And they're AV10 plus, so they should be sticking around. And when you can play an AV10 plus with regen, if he does get hurt, uh, then there's a 50-50 chance you'll just get it back uh, and it'll be back in your reserves box for the next drive. Uh, from a leveling up point of view, I think trolls are really simple and I don't think there's very much you want to do with them. Uh, first of all, we go into the strength tree, which is their primary skill tree. And you save up six star player points and you take guard. There's not much more to it. You should always take guard. That is the core skill for, for trolls. After that, if you want to stay in this skill tree, then things like stand firm are very strong because you'll go and park this player against some opponent people. And then you don't want that person to get pushed away. That's where stand firm comes in and it makes the troll uh, a massive nuisance. If you really want to stay in this tree and don't want to go anything, uh, do anything else, then you can look at grab, you can look at uh, brawler, 
um, because Brawler helps you re-roll both down results when you're blocking, and you might not want to save up for uh, something in the general tree, which we'll cover in a second. And Grab lets just keep players nearby so that you can do some good stuff. Uh, a skill to absolutely stay away from now uh, is Break Tackle. Uh, it used to be really good for trolls, where it used to change your agility stat into your strength. Sorry, your strength stat into your agility stat for one dodge, which, when you've got strength five, is a really good deal. But now it doesn't do that. It just gives you plus two to your agility stat if you're strength five or more. And notice their agility stat is five plus, so that now becomes a three plus. So they are now worse at dodging than they were before. Flat worse at dodging. So avoid that one. And then the worst skill in the game. Um, or certainly one of the worst skills in the game, Pile Driver. Uh, do not take this skill ever under any circumstances ever. Uh, I have actually been known that once I've randomed a skill, uh, Pile Driver, I've just fired the player instantly and started again. Now, over in the general tree, there is another skill that I think you really do want to be looking at, uh, and that is Block. There it is. Just looking for it. Uh, it is probably the best skill in the game, or it's certainly one of the top two skills in the game. Guard being the other, if you're curious. It's just because it's so good and it modifies the block dice. It'll stop you being turned over. It stops you getting knocked over as much. I think if I was building my perfect troll, I would go guard, block, or block guard, depending on how you're using the troll. If you're fighting with them a lot, then you need to take block first. If you're doing him quite passively, which I think is the correct route, then you want to take guard first. But either way around, you take the other skill. And then after that, um, stand firm is great. And there is also one other skill in here which is amazing, which is this one. Uh, defensive, uh, because it switches off your opponent's guard. Now your strength five with guard, and your opponent doesn't have any guard when impacting this player on their turn. Dealing with your troll becomes an absolute nightmare. And so uh, I think you'll start seeing um, as a second, well, sorry, as a third, fourth skill pick, uh, some defensive trolls. And they're really good. There is one other skill in here in the general skill tree, which is also great, uh, which is pro. And that lets you re-roll the really stupids uh, broadly and occasionally some blocks as well uh, or part partial blocks because it's now what on a three plus you can re-roll one individual dice. That's a change from previous pro which was on a four plus re-roll everything. You normally like to keep the, the pro for the, for the really stupids. Now the problem is that's a double skill, that's a double skill and that's a double skill. And double skills now cost 40 team value rather than um, 30 team value from the old game. So they're getting expensive. So that would be 120 for the secondaries. And then you'd be looking at uh, another 20k there. That's 140k. That's more than his base cost. He's a very good player, but it's more than his base cost. So if team value is important to you, you might not want to consider going absolutely crazy and putting all the cool skills on. You might want to just pick out a few of them, block and guard being the best examples. And finally, from a randoming and from a characteristic point of view, uh, avoid randoms pretty much. Uh, unless you're going to be running in the strength tree and you're you're happy to recycle because you get a cheap guard maybe or a cheap stand firm. But broadly, I, I would avoid randoming altogether. And I would also absolutely avoid statistics because the only stat that's on a troll that's any good really is uh, strength unless you're going to start trying to throw goblins with him. I would avoid the, the, the statistics unless you want to throw goblins and you start fishing for a, a passing increase. I think there are just better, stat, uh, better skills out there for him. Um, and, and on an orc team, throwing the goblin not a good idea next we're going to move on to the big and blockers big uns are replacements for black orcs uh in blood bowl 2 and they've got uh, a couple of changes so i think they've got three changes first of all they've picked up animosity animosity is the first uh, is a new skill in blood bowl 3 only one team had it in blood bowl 2 and animosity effectively means that any other players list in the skill uh, to hand the ball from one of those players to another one of those players it's a it's a two plus role because they won't do it. And the idea is that that player is the star of the team and doesn't want to give the ball away. Now, here, Animosity Biggins probably means nothing because the chance of you wanting to have a big a big one with the ball, that's probably not going to happen very often anyway. And then the chance that you need to give it to another big one specifically, no. Um, so don't worry about Animosity on the big ones. It doesn't really do anything. The next is they've actually had a movement increase. Unfortunately, they've had a 10K uplift in their price, but I think movement for 10K... On a base stat line, I'll take that. They're still strength four, which is great. They're still agility four plus, which is fine. However, notice they've lost their passing access. So now you cannot possibly farm passes with them. And it also more importantly means that if they catch a bomb or anything like that, they can't throw it back. So it's going to blow up in their hands. So bear in mind, they don't have a passing stat. They are AV 10 plus, which is great. And that means they should be sticking around. They're a really good player. 
And I think for the 10K extra, that's fine. I'll, I'll pay the 10K extra for an improved player in my view. Now, in terms of leveling them up, there are three core skills that I think you need to be considering. They are Block, Guard, and Mighty Blow. In what order you take them depends on how, again, you actually use the player. So if you're bl constantly finding yourself blitzing with the biggins uh, or a couple of biggins, then you probably want to go Block and Mighty Blow. And I would advise you go that order, not Mighty Blow Block. Then if you're finding that they are actually used as a support piece, then you want to go Block and Guard. And... However you are using them, always true try and put the other skill that you didn't take, whether that was Mighty Blow or Guard, as their third skill. So you get the holy trinity of Block, Mighty Blow, Guard, and they are amazing. Again, we need to avoid the Break Tackle skill. Previously, Break Tackle was considered a really good skill on uh, Biggins, or Black Ox as they were before, because it turned a Agility 2 player into Agility 4 player, or vice versa. So you weren't dodging on a 4+, plus, you were dodging on a 2+. plus. Now, they are Agility 4+, four, four plus still, so Break Tackle, no, avoid it. I think the other skills here are two players I would take with Stand Firm once I've got those three core skills. And then I would also take two players with the defensive skill. Uh, again, I just rate defensive that highly. Uh, it, you don't need it on everybody, but you do need defensive probably on four, five players overall uh, at high team value because you just want to switch off everybody's guard. Having two players touching the same guard piece with defensive doesn't do anything. You just need to layer your defensive across the field. So you probably want about four maybe five. A bit like tackle. You want to be able to get everywhere with tackle, but you don't need it on absolutely everybody. And if you also want to do some some fun stuff, then you could look at pro, you can look at tackle. They're also, yeah, they're great skills. Other than that, I think uh, biggins really do uh, just to fit the epitome of uh, a support blitzer type player, block guard, mighty blow, first skills. Would I random particularly? The strength tree is full of really nice skills, so you could start randoming. You can take Guard, you can take Stand Firm, you can take Mighty Blows. You've got three skills out of 11 to pick from. So you've got nearly a one in four to hit one of the perfect skills. And then there are some acceptable other skills in here. Um, Armbar and Brawler are kind of okay. Um, grab is good because controlling where you're going to put your opponent is great. Uh, and Juggernaut, if you go Frenzy, uh, which I uh, have done on Blackhawks previously, it is, is amazing. It's not optimal, but if you had a long enough period of time and you wanted to build a perfect team, you probably would start by running me in the strength tree and trying to pick up at least one of the uh, the core, core two skills here, um, Guard and Mighty Blow. And then you wouldn't be disappointed if you hit Grab or hit Stand Firm. From a characteristics point of view, no, again, there's, they're, not, they're not got a diversity enough stat line to try and consider trying to hit a stat. You'd be happy to hit strength, but you're not really going to hit it because it's a 1 in 16 roll. Void characteristics. And I would just save on getting those three core skills. Now we're going to move on to the engine room of the team, uh, which are the Orc Blitzers. And realistically, these Blitzers are, if the Orc team is going to do well, these players are really well leveled and you play well with them. Uh, because they're the fastest players you've got on the team at movement six. They've got average strength, they've got average agility, which means they can receive a, a handoff or a cheeky throw. Um, they've got a rubbish passing stat, but they're armor 10. Um, I think it's the movement and agility which makes them uh, so good, along with their skill access, which is general and strength on primaries. Uh, and that's where you'll be picking most of your stuff from. Now, notice they've got animosity all teammates. That means that once you've got the ball on a blitzer, getting off again is a two plus roll. It's not the end of the world, but you've got to cons carefully consider that once you've given it to a blitzer, you, you are not likely to want to try and move it onto somebody else uh, in, the, in the short term. They do start with a block skill because they're a blitzer, and that's amazing. That means we can build around that uh, and have a lot of fun. There are several different career paths or uh, player types within the blitzer that you might want to consider. First of all, you need a killer. So uh, that means you need to build into this. You need to take tackle and you need to take mighty blow. Most people will take mighty blow first because there's at lower team value, not that many dodge players uh, floating around. So take mighty blow, then tackle. If you get to higher team value, and you, you, you lose your killer, you might actually start with tackle first, so he's got the ability to knock stuff over more reliably. Once you've got those two core skills, then I think you move back into the general tree, and you should look at Frenzy. Frenzy means you're now getting four dice, or even six dice, on players that you want to knock over, and that seems like a great idea to maximise your probability of knocking over the opponent. If you want to then round that player out, then you want to jump back into the strength tree, and you want to look at guard, because guard should be on all orcs as much as possible, and also juggernaut, for both doing three options, really. Uh, one, it helps you add a little bit of sideline control, which is always good. You can then turn a both down result into a pushback. 
So that helps you push things towards the sidelines. It allows you to deal with stand firm players, of which as you increase in team value, you'll find more and more of those. And it also means that you can cancel the wrestle skill and you can knock over wrestle dodge players because you've got tackle to deal with dodge and you've got juggernaut to knock over and deal with a wrestle. Juggernaut is actually a really good skill once it's combined with the appropriate other skills like frenzy, block. So it, it is a good skill. So that's your five core levels. And notice we didn't need to step it outside the two primary trees for that player type. Next player type are the sort of support blitzers and the support blitzers probably want to take guard as their first skill because guard on an orc team lets you control the pitch and you are looking to um, control as much as possible. Once you've taken guard, I would take mighty blow and then after mighty blow, uh, it's a toss up between taking stand firm and taking uh, tackle. Ideally, you'd have both of those skills that would allow you to just press into your opponent, not get pushed back and you can apply mighty blow tackle um, and elves will find it a really difficult player to deal with. If you want to step into the, uh, the secondary tree, um, just to try and cover out some extra players, uh, defensive and dodge are really strong skills here. Dodge, because you've already got block, means that you've now got a blodge player. That's really strong. Uh, and defensive, if you do go uh, into dodge, then blodge defensive is an amazing combo. And you could also combat that even further with stand firm, because now you've got blodge, defensive, stand firm, your opponent is really struggling to move you, knock you over, deal with you, and that defensive skill just applies everywhere. While I've talked about support blitzes and killer blitzes, you can go off meta a little bit, um, or you can just mix it up a little bit and come up with some quite interesting player builds. In here, there is also sidestep, which is quite fun, uh, and jump up, which allows you to have a little bit of extra movement. They're both fun skills, and you can do a little bit with those. Uh, combining those skills up again, probably with dodge, and then you've also got diving tackle, which also can limit where your opponent can go. That skill, if you're going to take Diving Tackle, you probably want to combine it again with Dodge and you need to combine it with one of either Stand Firm or Sidestep so that you can get into your opponent and put pressure on them. And at that point, you also, if you're taking Diving Tackle, because you're saying to your opponent, hey, do you want to dodge away? You want to consider Tackle as well to really make sure they've got to use team rerolls to get away from you rather than anything else. That player would be really expensive and you probably wouldn't want more than one of them but there are several career paths there that I'm just pointing out that you, you've got available, not just the, the sort of the standard um, guard, mighty blow, tackle, stand firm kind of blitzer. Um, you can do some quite fun things in this skill tree uh, if you wish. One last thing I'm going to cover off actually, which is about the blitzers, and that's because of the next player type, is that do you use a blitzer as a ball carrier? That's because if we just drop out of this and look at the next player, the thrower, the thrower's movement is only five. Uh, the thrower is only armor 9+, plus, not eight, uh, 10+, plus, and the thrower also has animosity to everybody. So there is a school of thought that says, put your ball carrier as your fastest player, because then scoring touchdowns you can score from slightly further away, and it allows the breakaway plays to work more uh, cleanly. Well, movement 5 on the thrower versus movement 6 on a blitzer, you carry on the blitzer then. In my view, no, you carry on the thrower because the thrower is your passer, and he's got pass three plus. We can also jump into the passing tree and we can take accurate. So we can then make that pass a two plus. It's got pass skill. We can go, we can pass the ball 98% uh, of the time on, on, a, on a short radius. And we've also got a free short hand skill. You're not then leaning into team rerolls to pick the ball up potentially. Just because he's slow, that's okay. All the orcs get in the way and they just knock over everything and you can just walk through the gap. So I'm not worried about this and I don't use the blitzers. And then the final reason I don't use the Blitzer is because I've just covered in the previous section. Wow, how many different ways can you build a Blitzer? Um, I don't want to waste one of those career paths on Ball Carrier when I already have a Ball Carrier here. That just seems bonkers to me. However, some people are absolutely adamant that the throwers are rubbish. Um, and depending on who you listen to, depends on which side of the fence they sit. Uh, hopefully you're, you're now clear on which side I sit. From a level up's point of view, I'm actually going to dive into characteristics. And there's definitely a school of thought that says in here... I'd take a characteristic increase because I'd be delighted with a movement six thrower. In fact, I'd be delighted with a movement seven thrower. So you could just save up for characteristics. If I hit agility, fine. Picking the ball up now becomes less of an issue. Dodging becomes less of an issue. Sadly, uh, agility doesn't affect the passing stat anymore. So it's not quite as amazing as it used to be. However, um, I'm okay taking that. The passing stat, yes, I'd consider taking pass because it affects pass, all pass bandings. And, and as movement, agility, and passing... Uh, are some of the more common uh, random level ups you're going to get and they're the ones I want, I'm absolutely fine with taking a characteristic increase. Uh, if I hit strength, 
I would probably take it because just having a strength four ball carrier is is good. But at that point, um, he is very expensive, and you might have to start feeding one uh, defense as well because he's strength four. So you need to then go into here, and we need to take block as his next skill. No matter what, you take block. On a normal thrower progression, uh, however, I would recommend that the skills you want on a thrower are on the ball, which means that when the player is when the kickoff happens, you can move three free squares towards the ball, which really helps when you're in movement five, because effectively on turn one, you've now got a movement eight player. And if you happen to need to rush, you could even move 10 squares. That, and you've automatically moved three squares towards the ball as well, which is super important. I really like accurate. I really like leader because extra rerolls, uh, especially cheap rerolls, uh, are great. Being allowed to use more than one reroll on a turn now makes leader even more valuable. So um, consider all three of those skills inside this pa uh, passing tree. Um, and then I really like the idea of block for defense. That could kind of rounds out what I'm looking for on this player. So movement six, because I'm fishing for a movement. Block for defense. On the ball for being able to move around quickly. Leader and accurate. That's your five skills. Um, and I'm absolutely delighted with that as a thrower, if he ever gets there. After that, if you want to build yourself a, a weird thrower, um, or an absolute just sort of ball-carrying thrower, I think you're playing the wrong team, personally. I don't think Orcs synergize with a thrower, per se. But, you know, you could have a bit of fun with uh, Dump-Off. You could try and build yourself a Cloudburst to Cannoneer accurate type thrower, just for all of the throwing skills. It's not for me, but you, you, could, you could have fun with this player, and you could try and build yourself a, a sort of a quarterback on Orcs. The problem is... He's got uh, animosity to all teammates. He might not throw the ball. So just be wary of that. I think of the thrower myself as a ball caddy rather than um, an out-and-out -out thrower. Okay, next we're going to dump into is the goblin. Uh, and the goblin really has two possible uses. Um, and one of those is dubious at best. I'll talk about the dubious use, which is the ability to have the uh, goblin thrown while holding the ball and score a one-turn touchdown. If you're going to do that, you want to go into the agility tree and we need to absolutely be taking sure feet and sprint and catch. That means that the goblin stands just behind the troll on the halfway line uh, on, say, turn 8 or turn 16. Someone tries to get him the ball without throwing it to him and then uh, the goblin is hoofed over the line by the troll and we try and score touchdowns that way. Um, if you're going to do that, I would also lean into the characteristics because having an agility increase massively increases their ability to land on a throw. And we're also looking for movement so that the troll doesn't need a perfect throw to get the goblin forwards. If you also want to try and um, cut out being thrown, you could just take a movement eight goblin. So just keep fishing for movements until you've got both of them. Get sidestep, get sure feet, get catch and score a one turn touchdown the normal way. And that is you just chain push the goblin forward a few squares. They are absolutely possible reasons. And at high team value, you probably want one of these in your locker but at low team value, don't waste initial star player points on building all these players. This is a luxury player rather than a required player. The other player type that you do need, and I absolutely strongly recommend you get one as quickly as possible, is this skill here. Sneaky Gear is probably an, um, an S tier skill now. And that is because the probability of fouling if you've got Sneaky Gear gets you sent off around sort of 15%, whereas the probability of removing a player starts at around sort of 30% and then just goes up as you add extra uh, assists and, and whatnot. Once you've got Sneaky Git, come in here and add the Dirty Player skill and a Dirty Player Sneaky Git is absolutely lethal. It's the equivalent in Blood Bowl 2 terms of having a Mighty Blow Claw piling on player. It is that dangerous and this time Claw Palm is replaced by Sneaky Git Dirty Player and it's on a Goblin. <laughs> so you can play it as a Goblin and I, I really like it. The fact that you can keep moving is great. And because it's a general and a, uh, a secondary and a primary, uh, it depends which way around you want to do it. You can run it on a goblin or you can run that exact same player type on a line orc, which is a point of movement slower, but a hell of a lot better armored. So dirty player, and then you just go into the secondary tree and you get sneaky git. It's entirely up to you which type of player you use to do this for action, but make sure you have one of them, whether it's the goblin or the, uh, the line orc. I haven't personally settled on which one I like more. Um, my gut reaction currently is that I actually prefer the Line Orc to do this uh, job. And the reason I like the Line Orc is because um, they are much more durable. And at a pinch, you can use them as just line fodder. Uh, whereas the Goblin, if you put the Goblin on the line of scrimmage, someone will probably murder it. Uh, so bear that in mind. 
uh, other jobs for the line orc. Um, once once somebody is taking the sneaky git dirty player route, then you want to come into the general skill tree. You want to take block at low team value so that you've got a player that can stand on the line of scrimmage um, and fight a little bit. Um, at higher team value where everyone's got mighty blows and possibly claws and, um, and everyone else has got block, then take wrestle because on the line of scrimmage, if someone rolls school both down and you've got wrestle, your player is safe and it creates a little bit of a gap for you. At low team, if you've got block, they just take the both down and your player gets punched in the face again and he probably is not as lucky the second time. So wrestle's a great line of scrimmage skill. Uh, block is just a great skill. Uh, once you've got that and if you do get some more star player points, jump into the secondary tree and start saving for guard. Because you've already got block, that isn't 12 star player points anymore, it's 14 and block guard on one or two line orcs would be amazing. Uh, a randoming point of view, I would avoid it. Just go and get the skills that you need. Uh, don't try and fish for some random stuff, literally. From a characteristics point of view, no, don't say, yeah, you can save for a characteristic, just, just don't take them plus block guard or uh, sneaky get a dirty player because then they're, n they're not adding extra value. Um, so avoid characteristics. So that's all the players. Uh, in the next section, we're going to look at uh, rosters. Okay, let's talk about rosters. Uh, for the Orcs, I've actually put three uh, rosters together. They were all built around something slightly different. And so I'm going to dive into the first roster, and that's this one here. And this roster is built around three team rerolls. It's three team rerolls. It's all four big uns. It's all four blitzers, uh, which are the, the sort of the core eight of the players. And unfortunately, because we've bought all of this, uh, we then run out of money to buy other fun stuff. And so I've got two Orc linemen, and I'm having to field a goblin. Uh, on all both defense and offense that's a little bit tricky and it does make the first couple of games a bit challenging i actually played this roster very recently so um, i'm aware that the goblin is a problem however having three re-rolls is really super helpful it is probably my roster of choice so far we do get only one dedicated fan so we're not going to generate lots of money so the first couple of games while the dedicated fans is just normalizing to three or four um, you're not going to have lots of money However, luckily, we don't need lots of money because all we need to go and buy is our Apothecary and a 12th player, um, which is going to be probably the thrower. So we need to just save 65k. You'll have that in one or two games. That'll be fine. Okay, roster two is this one here. Uh, roster two is built around the concept of having all of the big strong things on the field as much as possible. So we've put, I've put the troll in for you. I've put all four biggins in and then we've got all four blitzers. So the top nine on this uh, are absolutely amazing. Sadly we ran out of money again. So I've only now got two team re-rolls and I'm having to field two goblins. Now, the good news is this roster's pretty quick with all of those players being movement six. The bad news is you're fielding two goblins. They will die. You'll be short-handed. I don't think this is a great idea, but if you want to bend the troll into this roster, this is kind of what you've got to do other than giving up the big uns. And I think the big uns are super important to have straight away. Whether you want to take this roster or not is up to you. I don't think it's as strong as the first roster I've just shown you. Um, and I think that the weakness of this is the goblins. So bear that in mind. It's also not great from a money point of view. And because you're feeling two goblins, they could die and you could find yourself shorthanded straight away. Okay, on roster three, um, I've tried to fix that somewhat and I've left the troll in for you and I've put the thrower in. And the reason I've combined the troll and the thrower is because the troll... Uh, costs 115k and the thrower costs 65k so you can add those two 5k's together and it means the rest of the roster is a bit more rounded a bit more balanced you'll notice they've got no spare treasury this time again i've put the four biggins in because i think they're absolutely critical uh, and to make the roster work i've had to drop a blitzer it's not ideal um, but it is possibly slightly better than the previous roster again i've had to put a goblin in which is a bit of a shame if you don't want to fake a goblin at this point you could drop the thrower drop the goblin and you could replace them all with line orcs so you've got a bunch of line orcs and that would probably be uh, just as strong the problem with it is you've only got two team re-rolls i'm relying on the short hand skill to pick the ball up so that's why if you're going to take short uh two re-rolls you probably want short hands if you're taking short hands then you have to take the rest of this roster uh, or we just have to simply drop the troll and if you drop the troll what you would would be able to do uh, is that you could then fire the goblin and replace that and you could possibly add a few extra dedicated funds. So if you're okay to drop the troll, I think you can make this roster better. I just don't have infinite different options to show you. So that's rosters. Uh, next, we're going to go and talk a little bit about um, 
uh, where are they? Uh, formations. There we go. Formations. So in orc formations, I'm actually going to, um, what I have here, I've built the roster as though uh, we've put all of the strong positionals on there. Uh, so this isn't from day one, but it's probably more accurate and more of a representation of what you're going to see from game three or four for the rest of the time you play this team. So on offense, uh, I've put um, blitzes on the line of scrimmage here and here. And that's assuming that number seven is blocking whoever's stood in the number two square. Number six is blocking whoever's on top, uh, in, the, in front of the number seven square. And then the troll, if it's a strength three player in front of number six, you're getting three dice. So that means you're getting three dice and mighty blow. And at that point, it does help. You're knocking over stuff a bit more reliably. In fact, it's an extra 15% knockover chance. Uh, and then you might be applying the mighty blow skill. So you might be able to get players ahead. You'll notice that there are five players on the line of scrimmage here. That's to try and make sure that we're getting all of our hits in. And then I've covered the wings um, on the inside of the wing so that if our opponent gets a blitz, then we've got two players flat here. It's difficult for them to knock them over and they've got to run all the way around the outside, around here. Um, they won't want to run through that square or that square because they haven't got the ability to dodge. So they're coming into us through here and around here. So that gives blitzing uh, a lot less, it makes it a lot less impactful. Back here, we've got uh, the two spare players. On here, I'm representing them as two linemen. Maybe they're two throwers. Whatever they are, they should be your players that you're uh, carrying the ball with. If you don't have on the ball, I do like setting up slightly further back. You can set up here. You could set up here. And the idea is that Orcs are very weak on offense while their, player, uh, their team is stretched out, where they've got the ball carrier isolated on its own and then the rest of the team on the halfway line fighting. Because you want to get your ball carrier up to that point uh, on the halfway line as quickly as possible. So with that in mind, if your players start back here, and let's say the kickoff is, oh, I don't know, there, let's say, uh, it goes one, two, three, four, five. We can now get to here. You're probably still far enough away from your opponent's team that that's not a problem. But your next turn, you can go one, two, three, four, five. We are now here or there with one go for it. That seems a very great trade. If you set up on the halfway line uh, with two players, now, the ball went into the same square, which I think was there. One, two, three, four, five. We end our turn here. Next turn, one, two, three, four, five. We are still not connected to our team. And that's when you're vulnerable. So do do desperately try and consider where you want to put your ball, ball receivers um, to try and cover this. That's why I, I do like being slightly further back. You've got to counter this with the fact that now, if the ball goes and literally lands maybe on the five square, your throws are too far away and you're going to struggle to pick it up. Okay, fine, pick it up with a blitzer. <laughs> because it's not like scoring on a blitz is terrible. And really, we're covering fail state and covering the consequence of a, a terrible, uh, terrible kick. So that's offense. Um, defense, I'm going to split into, I think there's three different setups. Uh, the first one I've called no line of scrimmage, and that's uh, line of scrimmage denial. And this is to try and stop your opponent getting line of scrimmage blocks on you. Uh, so I put the troll on there, and I've put two big ones. If these players can have guard, that'd be amazing. And it works even better if the troll has got defensive because then moving the troll out of the way is a real problem. And then none of these three players just in front of the troll would have guard. So hitting on the diagonal here is a one dice, even if from a strength four player. So the only way you're going to knock over number two is if you've got a strength five player that can stand on the line here. There are only a handful of teams that could even try this. So one defensive skill absolutely shuts down liners of scrimmage. That's why these guys are here, to, do, to protect the sides of this play, these two players. Um, and at that point, you probably aren't taking much line of scrimmage damage. This is the anti-frenzy version of the same setup. So we don't want number five or number four getting surfed. But you'll notice that I have put the big ones as uh, number five and four on the flanks. And the idea is that there's just no easy two dice blitzing uh, anywhere on your line. So this is a really strong um, denial of attack. Um, so maybe it should be called DDoS or something, I don't know. Uh, we've got the central hold. Uh, this is another turn one setup, and this is assuming that your opponent can deal with your line of scrimmage. And if they can, then what we're trying to do is just hold the center. So I've created two L shapes here, and it's critical that we've got number four and number two, which are big ones on the corners. I'm then protecting them with blitzers. Ideally, number eight and nine would have guard. If you've got killers, then they would stand in a seven and six squares, then big ones flank them. So you've got big one, blitzer, big one, blitzer, and it's the same on the other side. And the idea here is that you hold the center, you wait to see what your opponent's going to do, and then you go and deal with them. If you don't like that, and you want to dive in and make them, make the, you know, stop them getting past you, 
Then try this setup. This is the prevent a score setup and this is probably more likely to be used if you are, uh, you've scored early on your drive uh, and you're defending a lead or you've turned them over and you've gone and scored and now you just don't want them to score. Again, I'm giving up the line of scrimmage. However, I'm giving it up because uh, I'm not actually bothered about the line of scrimmage now. We're bothered about making them run past you. And so what I've got here is we've got Biggin on the outside, Blitzer, Blitzer, Biggin. And that means that running down the side, dealing with number five is quite challenging. And then trying to run through the gap uh, here is quite challenging and uh, dealing with number two. So they've actually got to go through your line of scrimmage and move it completely out of the way so they can run through the 10 square and then here if they want to run through without dodging. If they do set up shop in the middle, that's fine for you because all of your players can then swarm backwards and deal with the cage that's presented to you here. And it's much better than if, imagine we move this out of the way and they set up a cage here, you've now only got three or four players that can deal with it. All these players over here are, are likely irrelevant. So that's quite nice if it's turn, I you know you scored on turn five. If you want to try and defend a two turn, then there's one other tactic you can do which is you take the whole of this and just drop it back maybe two squares. And the idea here is that what your your players are stood in the exact squares that they want to set up their cage. And so they either have to make a load of go for it to set up a cage that's not in contact here, which is problematic for a lot of teams, or if they set it up here, then they're not scoring because they're too far back. So uh, the idea of a dropped uh, line of scrimmage, um, sorry, not a line, line of scrimmage, a dropped se second line is really strong. This is specifically for anti-two turns. Um, it doesn't work very well against anti-three turn. It's terribly against anti-four turn. So this is an anti-two turn specific. It's just a variant. And since it doesn't take long to demonstrate, I thought we'd just throw that in there as well. So that's Orcs and uh, defensive formations. Uh, we're gonna now dive into uh, inducements. Okay, we're actually going to call this uh, section Inducements and Strategy. Uh, as I've realised while recording this guide, I've not talked to you enough about uh, overall Orc strategy and how to, to play Orcs uh, effectively. I'm going to split this into two piles. We've got Offence and Defence. Uh, on Offence, because you're going to be carrying the ball on either a Movement 5 or a Movement 6 piece, it is critical that Turn 1 and Turn 2 go and fetch the ball and try and transport it as quickly as you can to the halfway line. On Turns 3, 4 and possibly 5, if you can see space, I would attack through it um, and not to the point where you've gone and stood halfway inside their half, but do think about the concept of moving forwards where possible. And that's because you're not fast and you're not agile. So if you're presented with space, certainly from maybe turn four, turn five onwards, you should start considering taking it. That means that you will score. I think it's better to score on turn seven and guarantee every time you got on offense you scored than it is to just not score at all because... If you scored every single time, they're only going to score back on you some small percentage of the time. Whereas if you don't score, it doesn't matter you're going into your half zero zero. With that in mind, also, if the drive starts to go wrong, don't panic. Just try and get the, to the half at zero zero. Stop trying to score and just make sure you don't concede. Orcs are a really good defensive team and there's a good chance you can turn them over. So just make sure you don't go in on your drives one nil down wherever possible. Now, in terms of how you might want to do that, because the, 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 the Orcs have got a lot of high strength, what you're looking to do is go and pick on uh, a couple of players of your opponent every turn and go and overload their team by going and sticking two or three really high strength or uh, a few players with guard onto something that's you know, a zombie or a, a, a line Orc or a line Elf or whatever and force dodges and force additional points of contact every turn so that you are forcing them back or you're getting extra hits. If you're getting extra hits, you've got extra chance of making removals. And once you've gone a couple of players up, you'll find space and it'll be fine. And if you're forcing additional dice from them, then you're going to be burning through their team rerolls. And by the time you get to turn six, turn seven, maybe they're out of team rerolls and now they'll fail something. And again, you'll have that space and you'll get through. So it's about forcing the issue with Orcs. And that's why I've been recommending earlier in the guide to take Guard over Mighty Blow because Guard helps you force that issue. Mighty Blow just lets you roll better. So if you're great at rolling dice, take Mighty Blow. If you like playing Blood Bowl, take Guard. It's up to you. Now on defense, the first thing you want to be doing with Orcs is you want to stay in central, you want to stay compact, you want to stay in the middle. And depending on your opponent, if they're a lot faster than you, you've got to be careful that they don't switch around on you. Um, and if they're slower than you or as fast as you, then all you need to do is just make sure that they can't go through the middle because they're not going to switch. They're just going to try and run through you. So central point is critical as it is with almost all teams and then um, again you play the high press game you push into them with guard 
and you will create gaps and you'll create confrontation, your opponent will then try and run down a side and that point you will then try and block some of your players free and deal with that running set of players that have run off. If you are lucky enough to be able to create space um, uh, on defense, uh, if I just use, if this, we imagine this was the halfway line and your opponent is stood where the infinity symbol is, what I would do to initially to try and create that space uh, is it's like the trash compactor defense. So your players will start off all line. Um, my first couple of blitzes on turns two and turn three, turn one, are to blitz one of the flanks. And I try and own that flank. So I create an L shape. And then every turn, the L shape moves across the pit field like this. And so you start with you start with a flat line and it just sweeps over and it just tries to then just crush them. Uh, and that, that will create uh, the best opportunity to turn them over. Do not just dive into them completely, because if you do that, what will happen is you will get knocked over, and then you'll take lots of armor rolls, and once you go down players with orcs, it's a real problem. So um, do try the trash compactor on defense, uh, and on offense, do take that space. I think they're the two key points that I want to get over to you. And on both defense and offense, make sure that you overload a few players every turn so you can create yourself extra blocks or you can create extra fail state for your opponent. Right, on to actual inducements. In here, um, there are, uh, as usual, the nine inducements we want to pick from. And because we should have taken a dirty player sneaky git, bribe is absolutely the S tier inducement for us on here. Um, there is nothing else on this page that normally gets close. So take yourself a bribe. Possibly take two. Don't, you know, um, stick in the cookie jar and get all of the cookies out if you can. Uh, you can take up to three. I think three is probably a little bit excessive, uh, especially with sneaky git now. But you do definitely want to keep keep bribes and keep fouling. Uh, Bloodwiser kegs have a weird value for us because we're high value, uh, high armor value. Losing players is unlikely. So in a low team value match, say against uh, elves, they're terrible. Uh, a high team value match against things with claws, they're amazing. So Kegs are massively matchup dependent, and if you think you're going to lose players, uh, get yourself a keg or two because going down biggins or blitzers is a real problem. Extra team training, you should probably avoid that because you should be running three rerolls pretty much exclusively, possibly even three plus leader. So this is unhelpful. Uh, a wizard is fun, but make sure you've taken a bribe first. Apothecaries only if it's in league play and you really need to make sure no one dies. Master Chef is garbage for every single team currently in the game. Uh, these two are just for 20k uh, to help you just soak up random amounts of money. And then we've got the bias ref referee. If you're playing into someone that's going to foul, pick up a bias referee because, um, as it says there, on a 5+, plus, they'll just get sent off. So do look at the, the bias referee, but it's matchup specific, a bit like the keg. Star players, we have access to four initially within the game. Uh, I imagine there will be a lot more. So if you're watching this guide video in 2024, then uh, this will be out of date. Uh, however, there are three star players in here that I think you might want to be looking at. Uh, Ripper, which I've already had some experience with. Uh, he's a little bit unreliable, but what he is is a strength six lump uh, with armor 10 plus. So that's fun. And for a very similar team value, you can pick up Varag Gulchua. I think now my considered opinion is Varag Gulchua is better. He is a little bit more money, but I'd drop the point of strength. But by dropping that point of strength, I get block and I get thick skull um, and I get jump up. Yes, please. I'll take all of those things for dropping a point of strength. That is a great player. And if you've got that sort of 280 point uh, amount, then he's great. If, however, you can get to full scum mode uh, and get the uh, the big boy himself, that's Morgan Thorg. Morgan Thorg is absolutely a monster. I've said it in all the other guide videos. I'll say it in this one too. He should be banned. He's got Mighty Blow plus two, which is just flat broken. He's also strength six and you're never going to kill him because he's armor value 11 plus. And then worse than that, if you knock him on the floor, he's got thick skull. So getting getting him off the field, yeah, that's a problem as well. So th this this is an absolute monster of a player. And if you can get him, do so. Irrespective of anything else, you should pick up Morg if you can get him. So that's your uh, that's your star players. And then the mercenaries. Uh, in here, the only time I would ever dip into this is for one of two reasons. Number one, I'm going to pick myself up a troll and I'm going to put guard on him because I need extra strength. Okay, that's possibility. And then number two, I would come in here and I'd be looking either hiring a goblin or a, uh, a lineman and I'd be looking at taking dirty player uh, or sneaky git depending on which one I can take. So goblins can take sneaky git uh, and linemen can take dirty player. That's a bit of a niche problem. 
and hopefully you've skilled correctly and don't need to do that second one. So the only time you come in here really is if your troll has been removed. Uh, sorry, and you need to replace it with a guard troll. Hopefully all of what I've just gone through gives you a comprehensive understanding of how to play orcs now. Um, please do uh, give it a thumbs up, give it a subscription if you like that and you can see all the other guide videos. If you'd like to see me play orcs, uh, live then come and join my twitch stream i do stream every tuesday wednesday thursday saturday and sunday evening uk time uh, from either 7 p.m in the week or 5 p.m on the weekend if you wouldn't mind leaving a comment in terms of what you thought that would be really helpful it helps the algorithm out and it helps the channel get me more discoverability um, thank you very much my name is andy davo and hopefully i'll see you sometime soon